Hello and welcome to the December 18th, 2018 version or episode, depending on how you want to look at it, of Homeschooling Helps. I'm Andrea Schwartz and I'm joined by my friend across the continent, Nancy Wilk. Hey, Nancy. Hi, Andrea. How are you today? Good. Well, we're a week before Christmas and two weeks before the New Year's. And uh, just as a scheduling note, uh, because Christmas and New Year's both fall on a Tuesday, we are giving ourselves and you, our listeners and viewers, the two weeks off. And so we will resume our broadcasts in January. And uh, my hope is on the things we have planned that they will be very foundational helps for homeschooling families to pursue true faithfulness in uh, serving God through home education. So there's my little commercial for next week, next year, I should say. Okay. Well, Andrea, today um, we're going to talk about, um, well, we actually had a question come in and I didn't get to talk to the person. So I don't really know all their, you know, what they were intending to ask. But the question was something to the effect of, you know, we want, we don't want to teach children what to think. We want to teach them how to think. And so I think that's a really a legitimate question. And, um, when I usually hear that, I anticipate that it's coming from um, someone who's maybe been in the public school system. They're accustomed to the the testing, you know, like we, we have to teach our children to answer these questions so that they test well. So our t- being tested is also a good thing. Our, our faith is tested. It's proven true. It demonstrates our mastery of a skill. But if we're just answering questions instead of really mastering the skill and understanding these 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 concepts, that that's the concern, I believe. So they want to know how, not just what to think, but how to think. How do we process these these ideas instead of just you know being able to check off the box? Okay. It's funny of- I, yeah, it's funny because I took the whole question a different way. Um, oh. Maybe it has to do with the region of the country I live or what I've been exposed to. But it's very fashionable for some parents to say, I am not going to impose my beliefs on my children. So I'm not going to tell them what they have to think. I'm going to let them figure it out and they can develop it for themselves. And through that process, they're going to come to good conclusions. So which either way we take the question, it really could be boiled down to is the what more important than the how? Mm-hmm. Or is the how more important than the what? Right. And my answer is yes. Yes. Because they're which, both important. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to give you a little anecdote. When I was a little girl, I um, I was um, in Catholic school, Catholic catechism. And when I got to be 12 years old, you know, they have that moment of when you go testing for your, conf- to do the confession. I mean, the, the um, confirmation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I can remember in my little, you know, 12 year old uniform, um, I would have say I was shaking in my boots, but I had on little black and white saddle shoes. So, but I remember the question from the head nun and I was literally like sweating bullets, guessing the answer was Jesus. And I guessed that the answer was Jesus. She passed me, but I don't really, you know, I, I couldn't really articulate all of that whole thing, except that was, that was the right answer. So is that kind of what we're talking about? We want to know the what and the what is Jesus, but how do we get from here to there? In well, our- yeah. I think that would work. That would work. But you have to think, okay, before somebody can do something, how to do something, they have to know what it is they're trying to do. And so if let's go back to the garden. Now, okay. there was a literal Adam and Eve. There's a literal garden. And God gave some instructions. And those instructions were the what. You can eat of any tree except for this one. So in that what, in those instructions, there was a boundary. And God, as the creator, sets the boundary. Now, the first test that we see 
arise in Eden is a test where Eve has to now take the what and think in terms of how is she going to answer this challenge? Now, if a, if a serpent came up and talked to me, I would be surprised. However, right. I can't put myself in her situation because it was just Eve and Adam and they were in this new thing. So everything was new to them. And so they didn't say, this has never happened before because we don't know how long it was before this actually took place. But she was given a challenge to the what. And history will tell us she didn't do so good. She, she decided that instead of going back to, let me check this out. I better think this through. I better talk to Adam. Maybe we can talk to God she decided that something sounded pretty good. So she had a what, and she decided not to reference that what. Mm. Now, okay. some people will say, well, you see, parents are just brainwashing their children. Whatever the parents say, the children will listen to. Yes. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, you have to receive the kingdom as a child. In other words, children are used to, tell me the what because they don't come out knowing the what, they have a sense, and we all do, of what's right and wrong, but they don't know bedtimes, they don't know refrigerator privileges, they don't know if they hear a word, whether that's gonna be something that people smile about or smack them upside the head, because you're not supposed to talk that way, things like that, right? And so what we want to do with our children is teach them how to think within the context of the what of scripture. Okay. So that sounds easy, right? You know, you have this big Bible and you just hand the kid the Bible and say, read this and then come back to me when you know it. No, but let's go look at the promises in scripture. One of the promises is trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Imagine if Eve had trusted in the Lord with all her heart and didn't lean on her own understanding. Oh, this makes sense to me. In fact, it sounds kind of pleasurable. I won't have to listen to Adam telling me everything he wants me to do. I can decide <laughs> this for myself. Thank you very much. Right? Yeah. right. And then she didn't lean on her understanding of what she knew. Right. And then, of course, their path was not straight. So I think the the process of teaching our children the what in a very real and practical sense is what Christian home education actually should strive for. The other things you learn in the process are instrumental to that carrying out God's call on the individual child's life. But when all is said and done, you can't acknowledge God in all your ways if you don't know what God has said on all these different things. Mm -hmm. So the what is um, becomes God's words, God's standard, the, the goal of our education in terms of preparing our children to know him and to walk in his ways and to, to represent him well. So that becomes the what. What are we doing? What did God say? And then think of the, the details of how that is walked out and processed um, within those boundaries. All right. So here's a great example. Let, let's take a young child, a child who by and large does what he's or she's told to do, but every now and then has this weird idea and decides to go try it. You know, I, mom and dad are still asleep. I think what I'll do is I've seen mom cut up fruit. I'll go take the knife and I'll start cutting up fruit and this and that. And, you know, catastrophe could happen because you don't really want the four-year-old if he hasn't been taught how to use the knife to do it. Anyway, so you have a situation there. And so the first question the, the parent has to ask is, have I ever delineated this boundary? Is the child basically trying to be helpful, but doesn't have enough experience or knowledge to say, wait a second, you know? So parents have to be saying, what can I deliver to my children now that helps them understand better the what 
so that when they encounter the how, they'll have a reference point. And that's why it's very important when parents are teaching the youngest of children to always reference it in terms of God's word says, the Bible says, and then give them real examples. And I was not averse to suggesting things that my children might do to point out to them that they shouldn't do that. I learned that when my first two of three children always decided to give themselves haircuts yeah. which were disastrous in terms of how they looked, but also in terms of what could have happened. So by the time the third came along, she knew that you were not supposed to do this. And she heard the story of how her sister and brother had decided to give themselves haircuts. But because I had the experience of saying, I really don't want this to happen again, I was able to reinforce the boundary and be able to give an example of it. So when our children sin, which they'll do, this is an, a way in which to say, okay, now you processed something in a particular way. This is what God's word says. How could you better process, process that differently next time so you don't fall into the same trouble? And see, that's the how, but if there's no what, if there's no real definition of good and evil, right and wrong, and it doesn't matter what the how is by and large, everything you do is fine. Sure. Yeah. If there's, if there's no what, then, then we can be our own God. We can make it up ourselves. We can figure it out as we go instead of recognizing this is what God requires of us. That's just, is what God requires of us period, especially as people set apart for his um, purpose. And, Right. Et cetera. So, so when we're looking at little kids and thinking, uh, uh, let's talk some more about maybe not the haircut, like um, coming to the table, there's things that we can learn at the table and, and we want to establish the what we come to the table, we eat, we converse, we practice sitting, we practice these things. So, so that does give them a what, you know, otherwise you could just, you know, it, without a what, then mealtime is running, uh, is in their car seat, eating out of a window or. Right. Okay. But here's a great example. So one of the early things you can teach children even to say and memorize is the 23rd Psalm. He prepares a table before me. See, it's very biblical to sit at a table. The whole idea of communing with people is eating with people. And so this is an establishment of, this is where we come together. We start this encounter where we're thanking the Lord for our food. So that's a practice that is very biblical in all things give thanks, right? And so then if somebody fails to show up when he or she's supposed to show up or complains about the meal or decides to disengage and pull out you know, the, the smart device or whatever it is, then there's the opportunity to bring it back to how is this not in concert with God's law? How is it not in terms of honoring God, in terms of honoring the family? You see, and these lessons, which might seem like, well, you know what, if people want to eat in the car, we go to fast food or whatever we want to do, it's fine because I say it's fine. Well, children need to understand parents are operating off of what as well. Otherwise, they think, I can't wait till I'm taller and I make my own money. Then I get to decide right and wrong. Right. So you might have Christian parents who are giving this false view that because they're the adults, they get to determine right and wrong for themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we don't have the proper what, then anything goes. And, and the kids' uh, preferences as good as the parents. And why and, not? Becomes really very very pragmatic. Well, you just want the kid to eat some food or and and go to bed. So, so give them a squeezy pouch and put them in their crib instead of, you know, some right. of these, you know, it, instead of instructing them. The how beca the how becomes a means to the what, and is that, is and, that and foundational to the how is that you're basing it on something. Mm-hmm. 
Now here's where it gets interesting and actually can get helpful, especially for moms when they have more than one child. The process of the what and then relating the how, you're able to give your child more and more responsibility, more and more freedom to exercise the what. So the more you have a child that's proving himself to be responsible, the more responsibility you can give the child. Inevitably, he or she's going to make a wrong choice. I, I understand, you know, and then where it's important, instead of being mad to be able to say, okay, I know what you were thinking there. T tell me why you thought this was a good idea. And then you're able to go back to, okay, now the child has a reference point on how to think. And so let's go fast forward. And the child now has <clears throat> her license and she's driving down the street and there's a hitchhiker and she's thinking, well, it'd be a good idea to stop and help somebody. After all, you know, if I was stranded, I would want help. And maybe it doesn't turn out so well if she stops. So the question is, okay, how could you have demonstrated responsibility, but as a female by herself, not stop and pick someone up and put them in your car, you see? And then before you ever let your new driver out there, I made a point of making these kinds of scenarios. Tell me what you would do here. Tell me what you would do there. And then it's a practice in the how. But if you've never let them engage in making some of these decisions and you're hovering all the time and you're making all the decisions, then you're going to smother the child or the young person because he's not always a little child anymore. And you're not giving them the opportunity to learn from the inevitable mistakes, but then you're there to help reason through how could this be done better? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So our what has to be, um, what does God's word say? What does God require? That's, that's the answer for the what that is the answer for the what, and then learning to do that in these different scenarios. This is really a practical application of God's word. So our how becomes doing that. So, so the first, the first line of, or, or the first step in determining our, our how of any given thing would be what Andrea? Well, that's why, I mean, this is not like two sentences, you know, just go to the Bible or what you said. I mean, my guess is your answer, Jesus was a really good guess. It was probably <laughs> going to be better than a guess of Goliath or, yeah. you know, I guess. But, you know, I, I think that our first step is, I mean, that is the right answer, but, but then right, we have but what I'm saying is the fullness of the answer. So when, when we had a whole series on God's commandments and the fact that we were skimming the surface and we were saying, this is just the beginning, you need to know the implications of it. Really this what, how thing, if I were sitting face to face with the person who asked is, you now know your homework. You now know what you have to do. You have to be able to relate what it means in all your ways, acknowledge God. Mm -hmm. It means in all your ways, whether or not you're going to eat this, whether or not you're going to say yes to this party, whether or not you're going to invite a certain person to come join you for something. Otherwise, we can get lost in emotionalism, especially around Christmas time. You ever notice how everybody's supposedly nice and has good motives at Christmas. After all, it's Christmas cheer. I don't think people's wickedness goes away, right? And so we have to stay true to God's definitions instead of the sentimentality that makes it so. Wouldn't it be nice if anybody who was hitchhiking was a good person and I could give that person a lift? You follow what I'm saying? I'm not saying don't be compassionate. I'm saying, how do you reason things through? And this will have implication as people get older. I know it's probably not fashionable to talk about the Me Too movement and all the women who want to say that they were abused. I know they probably were, but let's go back. Did they think before they put themselves in certain situations what the likely ramifications could be. So no matter what was wrongly done to them, did they have a how problem because they didn't really identify, they didn't know what was right or wrong. 
Why would you put yourself in certain situations? I'm not suggesting that bad things don't happen to people who are prudent, but so many things happen to people who are not acknowledging God in all their ways, and thus their paths are not straight. So I'm not excusing perpetrators. I'm saying if we're going to make a difference in the lives of our children, we're going to teach them how not to be in those kinds of situations. Right. And, but, and to do that, we have to know what God says. What God says, we're back to the what. What does God say in, in, these, different, in these different ways, in these different scenarios? And well, let me just say this. Let me interrupt here. It's not what does he say for these things. God is the essence and the root of everything. So it's not a question of can I find a way that God's word applies to this situation? The assumption should be it does apply to this situation and it applies to every situation. And so sure. if at the root of your thinking is acknowledging him in all your ways, it means that it's appropriate to because his word speaks to every area of life and thought. But we have to look and see what he said specifically about those things when we can, right? Because we can't just no, say, oh, can. that's what we God can do. Seed along our happy, uh, it, you know, we can't right. say, oh, I acknowledge God. Jesus is the answer and keep going down the road of foolishness. You know, we have to stop and, and actually go and look and see what his word has to say about these specific things. There's things that he says, do this. And, and walk in righteousness, do this, it's foolishness, the wages of sin is death, you, that's not the way to go. So so if we're going to step through this and teach our kids any, any, any um, you know, real development and practice of the what, we have to practice going to God's word and see what has he already said about this specifically what has he already said about that specifically we know that he's talked about everything but that that's going to start giving us these big stepping stones with which to say yeah we know we can move forward in this or we know that we can't and then when there's places where we don't see yet where he has specifically said yes do this don't do that then then there is um uh, met maturing, there's principles, there's, you know, there are other ways of discerning that. But, but it's too, there's too many folks that don't have those foundations in place that would just say, I acknowledge God. And, you know, like saying, yeah, I see that stop sign, but I'm going to keep going because that's for the guy behind me. You know, and we don't want to be doing that. So you're really talking about a systematic approach to scripture. So there's, a, you know, you can look at the Bible as an encyclopedia. Now, encyclopedias where I need to know about something. I'll go look that particular thing up. Okay, now I know about that as if it exists in isolation. I don't recommend that's how people approach their Bible. People should approach their Bible the same way that um, if you're in an airplane and they do the whole thing about the oxygen mask coming down in case, you know, you lose altitude, the Bible should be our always oxygen mask because in life, in a fallen world, we're always losing altitude. So we better have it handy and we better be preemptive in as much as as we read and learn God's word, as we learn the application of all of God's commandments to particular things, now we don't have to say, oh, I better go here to find out what I need to know. As you encounter these situations, you're like, I know what to do. I know how to do this. So remember, a lot of us didn't grow up with a systematic view of the authority of God's word. So guess who has the most work to do here? <laughs> Mom and dad. Right. Right. Because part and parcel of teaching your children how to think and I got a lot of mileage out of this, is let me tell you the story about how I did this and it was the wrong way to think. And let me tell you about the consequences of doing it that way. And let me suggest to you, you don't want to do it that way. And even though you may say, well, mom and dad turned out okay, I guess it doesn't matter. You make a point of teaching your children 
the wages of sin is death. And let me show you how this played out in our lives. And see, that's all about then the how. And you're referring it back to our ultimate what. Thus saith the Lord. What does the Lord say on any given thing? Right. And he has spoken on everything. He has. We. That, that's what makes biblical Christianity so different than everything else. We don't have an unknown God who hasn't made his wants and wishes known. He has told us what those are, and he has preserved his word since the dawn of time. And so nobody has the excuse that says, I don't know what he wants. We do know what he wants if we will look at it and then say, God's will be done, not our will be done. And that, of course, comes by the blessing of the Holy Spirit. So I'm guessing most of the people who come in, tune into our broadcast really do want to produce godly, uh, a godly environment in their home. And they have to understand they can do all this prep work and ultimately it will be the Holy Spirit visiting their children as to whether or not their children continue to walk. But we have done our stewardship job of teaching them the what and the how. Okay, very good. You got any more yeah. examples? Got more examples? Oh, I, I've, got, I've got plenty of life examples. I'm not sure that my family deserves to have everything that we ever learned <laughs> put forth here. But I think most people will be able to realize, especially if you look back in your own life, and those of us who were converted as adults have very, very obvious examples. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why it's important that as we learn biblical history, I mean, King David gives us plenty of good examples. Jacob and Esau give us good examples. King Solomon gives us good examples. The Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul, they give us good examples. We should go to the Bible and say, this is our family history. The good, right. the bad, and the ugly. But ultimately, in God's economy, his people have a redemptive plan applied to them. So don't be afraid to share with your children the bad decisions you made or the almost bad decisions and how you didn't make the bad decision when you repaired to God's word and said, wait a second, let me think this through. Let me acknowledge him in all my ways. Right, right, right. I do think that the um, that, that is that that is going to be that pivotal point where we where we do not say, well, we'll just let my kids figure it out or, or, or figure out how they want to live their own life is, is to introduce God's law, his word as in, in a biblical worldview is comprehensive um, as, as the total um, sovereignty and lordship of Christ really is. And so, so there is nowhere that we can go that is apart from him, apart from what he has already um, spoken about. I, I, I think that it is a good discipline to say, well, what has God said about this thing? Because that's right. where we start to build structure to this and foundation to, to our 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 faith, where we know the answer is Jesus. We just don't know what he said and what he requires in these in these other ways we don't understand sometimes that that comprehensive um i am he, exactly he not. so think of the word in the in the proverb i was quoting acknowledge acknowledge mm -hmm. the root of that word is knowledge in other words the person is going back to her knowledge. What do I know to be true? And sometimes what she knows to be true isn't what she wants to do. That's the warring in her members that Paul talks about. We're not fully sanctified, but if you know what to do and you know this is what God said, you have a much better chance of not giving into the temptation, especially if you're growing up environment was all about what does God's word say about this? Mm -hmm. right. I've heard people today say things like, 
when you explain something that's happening to somebody in their early 20s, oh, they're still so young. I mean, seriously, somebody in their 20s, no, somebody who's four or five, let's call them seriously young, right? But in many cases, the four and five-year-old, and I've encountered them, have been taught God's word, and they see it as the black and white it is. This is something we don't do. So as our society keeps giving people a pass and saying, oh, they're so young, we have people who are in their 30s who still think of themselves as young. They're not young in as much as immature and they don't, they shouldn't know what to do. They're young maybe in terms of the number of years as opposed to somebody who lives to be 100. But the maturity that God's word produces is something that we should expect to see in our children who are young children. We don't have to right. wait till you're 50 to be mature. Right. The scripture tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's where we have to start with the fear of the Lord and that all um, knowledge and understanding is in Christ. So, so nothing that we can really teach our children is apart from him. We have to recognize that in very, very practical ways and, and remember that he has given us his word. He's given us his spirit and we cannot, neg we neglect it to our peril. And uh, so as faithful um, stewards of God's word and um, parents in the lives of our children, we have to teach these things to our children. It's commanded. And if we don't know them ourselves, we have to teach them to ourselves. And you don't have to wait till you're an expert. If you know something, you can impart something. So make, I think that would be a good resolution for people to make in 2019. And I'm going to plug again the Calcedon Teacher Training Institute, ctti.org, where you as a homeschooling parent can go through Dr. Rush Dooney's Institutes of Biblical Law. If you do a section a week, great. If you do a section a month that that's all you have time for, great. You do it at your own pace. We don't charge for it. We will ask for a donation if you benefit from it to help Calcedon continue to do the work it does. But by and large, the more you know, the better you will be in acknowledging God in all your ways. So I highly recommend it. Uh, I can see that over the past couple of months, there have been an uptick in people who are actually participating. So I'm hoping that this broadcast has something to do with it. Um, but uh, it it's, it's, will make your life not so much easier, but more confident in terms of doing that which God calls you to do. Well, Andrea, thank you. Uh, Merry Christmas. It's been a And pleasure. I will talk to you next year on this broadcast. We'll have to wait a whole year now before we do this again. Very good. Okay. All well, right. Thank you, Liam. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Bye-bye.